Welcome back. Today I'll be revisiting Diet Pi, which is my preferred operating system for the Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. The main things I'll be covering today are how to install a desktop environment and how to install OpenSSH, which will allow you to modify files on the Pi directly from your PC, so that you can use your preferred GUI-based text editor instead of editing files from inside the terminal. If you've been following my previous videos on Raspberry Pi, then OpenSSH should be extremely useful, and I'll also be giving a few more helpful tips as well. So let's start off by talking about desktop environments. In my previous video, I didn't show how to install a desktop environment, and several people seem to be either confused or even upset that I wasn't using a GUI-based desktop. So let's clear a few things up first. Even though it's possible to run a desktop on the Pi, and I'll be showing how to do it with Diet Pi in a minute, that's not really what the Raspberry Pi is meant for. There might be a few use cases where it makes sense, but generally speaking, if you're looking to buy a small system to run a full desktop, then you should be looking at a mini PC such as this instead. That's because the Raspberry Pi is an extremely low power device, meant to run programs and applications in the background, and it falls into a category known as an embedded system. It's more suited to be a small headless server that can run things such as a media server, a 3D printer server, a small Minecraft server, Pi-hole, and many other lightweight applications. Most of these apps provide a browser-based GUI that you can access from a separate computer on your network, rather than connecting a monitor directly to the Pi. Not having a desktop means more resources are available for the applications that you actually need to run. But even though the Pi's CPU is pretty weak and will struggle to do ordinary things such as watching YouTube videos, as I'll be showing here in a minute, the trade-off is that the Pi only uses between 5 and 10 watts of power, which is considerably lower than a standard computer. Also, another thing that makes the Raspberry Pi unique is the GPIO header, which is something that's not available on a typical desktop or laptop PC, but rather this is a feature commonly found on microcontrollers instead. GPIO pins allow the Pi to interface with a wide variety of circuits and sensors, and are useful for applications such as home automation projects, robotics projects, and similar use cases involving circuits, which are the sorts of things I'll be focusing on in my future projects. But despite all this, the new Raspberry Pi 5 is quite a bit faster than previous generations, so running a full desktop environment and using it as a general purpose computer might actually be feasible now. If we go to the download section of Diet Pi's website, you'll see a new entry for the Pi 5, but you'll also notice it says testing. At the moment, not all hardware features are supported, so if you own a Pi 5, then you might want to hold off on Diet Pi for now and install the vanilla Raspberry Pi OS instead. I'm sure the final release for the Pi 5 will be out soon though. Keep in mind there's nothing wrong with the official Raspberry Pi OS, and in fact, if you want to get up and running with a desktop environment quickly, then it's actually easier with the official release. But there are a few small differences which make Diet Pi slightly better, as I went over in the previous video. So while it might take a few more steps to get a desktop running, Diet Pi is also compatible with a large number of SBCs, so getting familiar with it is pretty useful if you plan to jump deeper into the world of SBCs. Now, I actually don't own a Pi Model 5 yet, so for this video, I'll be using a Pi Model 4 instead, just to demonstrate the installation process. So let's start by logging into the Pi via SSH. Now the first thing we'll need to do is set the video resolution and turn on the HDMI port if you haven't done so already. To do this, let's enter sudo dietpi-config. Go to display options, then display resolution. You'll notice it's currently set to headless, which disables the HDMI output. We can enable HDMI by selecting one of these resolutions, but it's best to select the first one, which will also provide GPU acceleration. 
So let's select VC4-KMS-V3D. Now push escape to go back and go to GPU slash RAM memory split. You can see 64 megabytes is recommended for a desktop, but just to be extra safe, I'll be going with 128 megabytes. Now push the escape key, and when you see this message, select OK to reboot the system. After it boots up, log back in and this time enter sudo dietpy-software and scroll down to browse software. You'll see a long list of all types of applications which you can easily install here. But let's take a look at some of the different desktops available. We can find out more info on dietpy's website. The first option is called LXDE, and this is an ultra lightweight desktop. It's extremely minimalist, and you can tell just by looking at the screenshot. And in my opinion, it's a bit too basic. Now let's scroll down to LXQT, which is more advanced than the previous one, but still pretty lightweight. This one is a good balance of being lightweight and having more advanced features. Now, XFCE is another good option, and you can find this one on full-fledged Linux distros as well. But since it's not as lightweight as the others, that means it'll be harder to run. There are a few other options here, but I think the ones I just mentioned are the best ones. For this tutorial, I'll choose LXQT, but the process will be the same with the others if you want to go with one of those instead. So I'll push spacebar to select it, then push tab, and enter to confirm the selection. Then scroll down to install and push OK to confirm the installation. Next you'll be given the option to install a default web browser. I'll select Firefox, but you can choose Chromium if you prefer that. Now the installation will start. After a few minutes you'll see this screen pop up to configure the auto start script. Select OK and then scroll up to the automatic login option under the desktop section. Now select which user you want to use to automatically log into the desktop. In most cases, you'll want to select a user other than root. In this video, I accidentally selected root. And as you'll see, everything I did is working fine in this video. But again, when you're trying to do other things, I highly suggest you choose a different user other than root. Now push escape and then enter sudo shutdown dash h now. Next, I'll connect the Pi to a monitor using an HDMI cable and also connect a USB mouse and keyboard. Now I'll reconnect the power supply and the Pi should start booting up. After about a minute, it should automatically load our desktop environment. And here it is. As you can see, it looks pretty similar to a normal Linux distro, but more minimalist. And there is barely any applications pre-installed other than the web browser so you'll need to manually install applications you want to use. Now, since I'm using a 1440p monitor, everything looks slightly too small. So the first thing I'll do is change the resolution to 1080p, which will also reduce the memory usage and make things slightly easier to run. Now I'm gonna open HTOP so we can monitor the system usage. And as you can see, things don't look too bad yet. CPU use is low and the RAM isn't doing too bad either. But now let's open up Firefox and you'll notice the CPU spikes up to 100% at times and that's just from loading the home page. Let's now head over to YouTube. And again, you'll see we have high CPU use and it's taking a considerable amount of time to load the home page. It's taking so long you probably have enough time to go grab a coffee and be back before it's done loading. It's getting there, let's just wait a little longer. Alright, finally. So now let's watch one of these videos. Let's see Tom and Jerry. In German? Not sure why that's being recommended, but let's give it a try. I'm not recording audio so we won't be able to hear it. But anyway, the point is to look at the performance. CPU usage is extremely high, and you can tell the system is struggling to play the video. If we take a look at the drop frames counter, that confirms the CPU can't keep up with these demands. And we can see one of the cores is pinned at 100% use. 
If I scroll down the page, we can see the rest of the cores spike up and overall everything is very sluggish. Again, I'm running this on a Pi 4, which is considerably faster than the previous models, so just imagine how slow this would be on one of those. My Pi 4 happens to be the 1GB model, so we might get better performance on a model with more RAM, but again, the previous generations only have 1GB or less, so this is actually a best case scenario if you were to generalize performance across most of the models. But from what I can tell, performance should be considerably better on the latest Model 5. But generally speaking, I don't think it's very useful to run a desktop environment with the Pi. There might be a few applications that run smooth, for example running a lightweight IDE or text editor, but as I'll be showing here in a minute, you're better off just using OpenSSH to edit files on the Pi from your laptop or desktop instead. But one of the use cases where connecting the Pi to a monitor actually makes a lot of sense is retro gaming. Raspberry Pis are a popular option for modern arcade cabinets and retro game consoles, and they have plenty of horsepower to play these types of games. So if you're interested in gaming on the Pi, then you should check out Retro Pi, which supports emulation of over 50 systems. And while it is possible to install RetroPie on top of your DietPie installation, the process isn't super straightforward and you're probably better off ditching DietPie and flashing the pre-made image for RetroPie. Doing this should give you the best hassle-free experience, but I won't be going into detail on setting this up. Let's now move on to OpenSSH which is the premier connectivity tool for remote login with the SSH protocol and supports SFTP server, which allows us to modify files on the Pi from our PC. By default, the Pi comes with DropBear installed, which allows us to log in using SSH. But OpenSSH offers more features than DropBear, so let's go ahead and replace DropBear with that. So I'll first log back into the Pi using SSH and then enter sudo dietpi-software. Go down to the SSH server option and change it from DropBear to OpenSSH server. Now go down to install and select OK to begin the installation. Once that's done, enter sudo reboot to reboot the system. Now try to log back in with SSH and you'll notice you get an error message. This is because the encryption key that's stored on your PC no longer matches the key that's on the Pi, since removing DropBear and installing OpenSSH generated a new key. This same thing will also happen if you ever decide to flash a new image onto your SD card, since chances are the Pi's IP address will remain the same even after flashing a new OS onto it. And this also applies to desktop and laptop PCs whenever you install a new Linux distro on one of them. To fix this, all you need to do is remove the stored key that's on your PC. You can do this by entering this command, ssh-keygen-r, and then enter the IP address of your Pi. Now when you try to log in again, you'll be asked to confirm the new key. Simply enter yes, and now you're good to go again. So enter your password to log in as you normally would. Now let's try out a SFTP connection. Thankfully Linux makes this extremely easy. Most if not all file managers have the ability to make SFTP connections. Here I'm using KDE which has the Dolphin file manager. But like I said, most other Linux file managers should also support this. All you need to do is enter sftp colon slash slash and the IP address of your Pi. Next enter your login details and then you'll automatically be taken to the home directory of your Pi. Now if you want to access this from a Windows PC or a Mac, then I suggest checking out this application called Cyberduck, which supports the SFTP protocol among many others. Keep in mind, SFTP connections aren't just limited to the Raspberry Pi, and you can set up OpenSSH or similar software on any system. But now let's test this out by creating a simple Python program. 
I'll name it test.py, and now we can edit it with our preferred IDE or text editor. In this case, I'll use Kate. Now let's create a simple hello world program, then save it, and now I'll go back to the Pi's terminal and enter ls to list the files in my home directory. And as you can see, my test.py program is indeed here. So now let's try running it. And as you can see, it printed out hello world just as expected. So hopefully this makes things easier when it comes to writing programs on your Pi. Since using the terminal's built-in editors such as Nano isn't exactly a fun experience. And using a full desktop IDE or text editor is a much preferable way to code and edit files. And finally, I have one last tip I'd like to point out. It's possible to boot directly from a USB SSD rather than an SD card, which will not only boost performance but also offer better reliability. This feature should already be enabled on the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus and newer. But for the Raspberry Pi 3B and older models, you'll need to follow a few easy steps to enable the OTP bit. So I'll leave the link to these instructions in the video description if you'd like to do this. Just keep in mind that an SSD requires extra power to run. So I suggest using a power supply that can provide at least 3 amps just to be safe. Well, that wraps up today's video. If you found this content useful, then be sure to give the video a thumbs up, and if you have any thoughts or questions, feel free to drop a comment. Also wanted to mention that I previously made a video showing how to set up and use the Pi's GPIO pins in Python, but I only did demos using the output pins, not the input pins. So I'm planning to do a video showing a few different ways you can use the input pins, and also show some demos using various sensors, such as a distance sensor, gyroscope, IMU, and much more. These topics will eventually lead us to some robotics projects which I have planned for later down the road. So if this sounds interesting then be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. But anyway, that's all for today. As always thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.